Oi. All right, Josh Crum, uh, co-founder and chief strategy officer of Gold Money. Welcome back. Thank you. You, you, know, you, you and I keep bumping into each other in strange places. You know, it, was, yeah. it was Toronto last time, and then we bumped into each other in Hong Kong a couple of months ago, right? And now so, New York. And here we are just, in New York. It's, yeah. yeah. It's, you know, I wanted, to, I wanted to bring you back and talk with you because you and I sat in a coffee shop in Hong Kong and just had a fascinating conversation. And I really want to get a chance to kind of pick over it with you for the, for the Real Vision audience. And so, you know, you, you and Roy have been on before. You, there's a great think piece that the two of you did previously. People should go back and watch that and find out a little bit about the background. Just give us the quick and dirty for those of you that haven't seen it. And then we're going to talk about religion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably the best way to start it. Yeah. yeah. I'll try not to say the G word uh, yeah. for for the first 15 minutes of the interview. Okay, yeah, okay with a four-letter G word, yeah. it's a three-letter G word. Just leave that out of it. Okay, so I can say God, I just can't say go. Uh, all right, all right, well, we'll, we'll continue. So give us the really quick background just so people get a sense of where you come from and then we'll uh, we'll go down some path or other. Yeah, sure. So I'm an engineer by by background, so uh, so so naturally not that good on camera or any of that. So if I start wandering and, you know, the complexity in my head's not coming out, I'll right, you just back, you know, don't worry. bring me back. But uh yeah, I mean, I, I think I, you know, so I have an engineering background. I also have an economics uh, background. Um, and I came from doing, uh, uh, you know, well, quantitative political risk was actually my, my, my master's work um, and, and how you try to quantitate uh, political risks, uh, particularly in the extractive uh, resource sector. And, you know, for me, I, I guess in general, I'm more of just a systems guy, um, whether it's uh, financial systems, geologic systems, economic systems. Uh, I like, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess me and my, my co-founder uh, and CEO Roy Sabog were just those annoying kids that just, you know, keep asking why, why, like, why does that right. work? Like, just not, you know, never accepting the, uh, uh, the, the the given answer or the accepted answer. So I think that's, you know, my, my background is is really um, engineering. Uh, worked in the mining industry. Uh, and then I worked at Goldman Sachs, um, so you know, try not to hold that against me. But uh, I was the senior metal strategist in the economics, uh, global economics department. Uh, so I looked at at the way things like copper and gold moved relative to, you know, obviously oil and the rest of the commodities, but also macroeconomics and and uh, fixed income mac macro assets in general. So uh, I guess that's my uh, that's that's my bias and background. And so and so you know. Thanks to the complete lack of any political risk out there today, this is a, this is a great area for you to be in, right? So, so yeah. you know, you and I sit and chat in, in Hong Kong, and, and we get around to talking about religion, and we but we're talking about religion as relates to the precious metals complex, and mm -hmm. and you know, both of us I think struggle with the same question, which is which is what is it that people have against gold? What what is yeah. what is the the visceral revulsion to it? Yeah, exactly. And that's how I actually usually try to start, you know, whether I'm talking to mainstream media or, or a lot of, you know, I, I try to diffuse this, this religious tone of like, you know, we want to debate the theories of money. We want to debate the, the, uh, the view of, of, you know, whether it has value or not, subjective, objective, the money veil, like all of these issues, you know, you can debate them theoretically all you want. But the way that I came to gold was actually through that through that path of not really understanding or not liking gold because of the same religious context of, of you know, does it have value? Objectively, it does. So, so I came to it realizing, okay, no matter what people are saying, there's a market, and this is what the market is telling us. So, so if you look at the market that is telling us, then you have to figure out why. Uh, so, so you see the correlations, you see the price movements, uh, and, and you know, you're always comparing relative assets. Gold has this particular path and performance why? Um, you know, we know that it doesn't pay yields and it doesn't do anything. If you hold, you know, gold for 100 years, it's still just going to be a, a, an ounce or a gram of gold. That's the old, you know, Warren Buffett adage. But actually, that's probably one of the most important things to understand is after 100 years, you'll still have an ounce of gold. Tell me one other asset in the economy, which is the same. You know, even if you have an ounce of copper, is it the same 100 years from now? Um, certainly, if you have a loaf of bread, it's not going to be the same 100 days from now. Uh, if you have a company, it's likely not going to be the same, you know, a hundred, uh, you know, a hundred years from now. So, so that quality of actually lasting is actually one of the most important qualities. Um, and, and so this is the first thing that, that you kind of have to figure out. And, and this is what sort of Roy Sabog, you know, Roy and I both 
came from, from these, these questions from very different perspectives. Him being in finance and, and you know, a real Warren Buffett trained value investor and trying to understand the fundamentals of, of value and, and, and you know, why things get off the path of, of fundamental value. Uh, and I came from an engineering systems standpoint and I tried to understand the macro economy. So he's very micro, I'm very macro. And trying to understand how, um, yeah, like like how these these major complex systems work uh, work to create price, but but what Roy came to in his analysis was the physics of gold. Uh, he ultimately reconciled uh, through a micro system that gold is going to be the same 100 years from now because of the physics. <laughs> it's it's this one one element out of the periodic table that it seems to resist entropy. So so that that that's kind of the way the way he came to it, um, and and so it's it's I, I think that's that's where we have to start with is, is just the, the, the fundamental truths that you can't question. <laughs> well, so let's, let's talk about those truths because you, know, you, you spend a lot of time talking to people who, who understand it and they accept those truths for what they are. But naturally, you also speak to a lot of people who are skeptical or downright displeased. And you know, neither you or I in this interview are trying to convert anybody. I just think it's a very interesting conversation with people watching this who, you know, who are long gold, there were people right. watching it who hate gold. So I, you know, I'd, I'd love to just have this discussion. Yeah. Pick a side, it doesn't really matter to yeah. me. But I just think it's an interesting discussion to have just because of the different ways that people come at it. So you know, when, you, when you talk to the people who think gold's a worthless pet rock, right. what, what's generally the view that you get thrown at? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think the, the, the pet rock view is that somehow we're hoarding and wasting opportunity to be investing or doing something else. Um, and and I, I think there's, there's two aspects to that. There's the investor that wants um, you know, an outsized return and, and they, they tend to forget that risk and return are, 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 are typically you know, are, are two sides of the same coin. Um, and then there's the, the different side is the economic you know, doctrine you know, crowd which you know hates the gold standard and hates you know and wants to be able to control the economy through some sort of you know mathematical you know uh, you know levers and 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 be able to control it. So they don't like gold because it's a system they they don't believe they can control. Um, whereas the investor that doesn't like gold just doesn't like the the boring returns or the fact that it yeah. doesn't do anything. Uh, so there's no real story to tell around it. Um, I, I think those are probably if I'm going to read the, you know why you know what one of the uh, one of the stories I like to tell, again, getting back to the objective reality versus the theoretical, you know, views or debates, um, is you know I, I was having a conversation with with a European Central Banker, and he basically said, you know, right when I again, right when I introduced myself, I said I'm from gold money, and again, the the religious, you know, alarm bells go off, and it's like, oh, I have my views on gold, and I think my, I, I don't know, I was just, you know, particularly confrontational that day, and I just. Told him right back. It's like you know what you know that that's great. There's a market that has a view right back. <laughs> right. It's called price. Right. <laughs> and so whatever your views are, there's a price. That's what I'm trying to understand. <laughs> so I mean, did, did he? I'm interested because did he go into what his views were, or did you not actually have that conversation? I, you can't go very far down the track. You know, you start yeah. quoting all these theories and doctrines and and mathematical models. But but again, you know, just just kind of put that all aside. Let's let's you know get back to what money is supposed to be. Uh, you know, a store of value, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. And, and I'll kind of go through all of them. But the very first objective me me metric when it comes to valuation is store of value. Yeah. So, so let's look backwards. We, we can't do anything about looking forwards. You know, not yet. You know, maybe Elon Musk will solve that. But, <laughs> but you know, looking backwards, uh, what we do know is that, that, that gold works as a store of value. You know, ba back to the... Um, uh, you know, you know we'll, we'll put that aside in a second. But, but if, you, if you look at, um, you know, we did a report for Back to the Futures. Uh, Marty McFly, uh, 30 years from 1985 to 2015. Um, and of course, during the media, you know, during that, that time in 2015, there was all sorts of talks about hoverboards and, you know, automatically lacing shoes and all of the different predictions, Cubs winning the World Series. Yep. <laughs> you know, all of these things uh, were happening in speculation in the media. 
But people forget there's a few other concepts like money and the, the $50 for a bottle of Pepsi. So, so we looked, uh, we actually looked, how did money actually change during that 30 year time period? What did price levels change during that 30 year time period? And we, we basically gave Marty three options. Uh, he could take a, a, an ounce of gold with him uh, in, the, in the DeLorean and, you know, into the future. He could take, um, you know, he could take a hundred dollar bill or he could let money compound in a bank account for 30 years. Uh, and what does he have at the end of 30 years? So, so again, this isn't theory. This is right. what objectively happened looking backwards. And, and what we found is if you measure, so we started with the Big Mac index, you know, the, the economist famous index for prices and currency values around the world. And we looked at it, you know, the Big Mac index through time. So if, if Marty brought his dollars, he could only buy one third of a Big Mac 30 years from now. If he let money compound in a bank account for 30 years, you know, this, this so-called management by central banks of the store of value, he would have got, you know, l let's say he didn't even have to pay, pay tax on interest. You know, remember when we used to have interest? Right. Um, <laughs> and, and so, so if, he, if he let it compound for 30 years, uh, he would have got about, I, 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 I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was like 89% of that Big Mac he would have got back. Uh, and, and then if he would have used gold, gram for gram, he could have bought the Big Mac. Uh, so, so we were like, okay, well, that's a very much a commodity good. So as a store of value, you know, a Big Mac for, for gold, it works the test of time. Let's go through other aspects of the movie, other aspects of the economy. Uh, and we went from like his pickup truck, which, which obviously there's a lot of IP, there's a lot of engineering, there's a lot of manufacturing. Um, but at the end of the day, a pickup truck, you know, or, or white goods, there's still a big bulk commodity component to it. His, uh, his Toyota pickup truck, 30 years in the future, same price. Uh, measured in gold, same math when it comes to the dollar, buy a third of a truck, uh, same math when it comes to compounding interest in a bank account for 30 years. And then we get all the way down to a pure service economy, like a movie ticket, uh, and, you know, the, the 3D Jaws from the, from the movie. Yep. Uh, and, and if you look at the movie ticket over 30 years, everyone complains about this too, uh, movie tickets. You know, it's so expensive to go, go see a I'm movie kidding. with a family. Gram for gram, Gold price, movie ticket, same 30 years later. So, so we see objectively that the math, this works. Now, will this work over a two-year time span, a three-year, a five-year? No. When you're, within a, when you're in, within an economic cycle, uh, there's all sorts of you know, backwardations, contangos, there's you know, shortages and surpluses. It, it's information we're always trying to refine and figure yeah. out price levels. So it doesn't work on a short-term period. But with gold, prices revert. And, and, and that's, you know, a lot of the economics of mo models has always believes in these mean reversions. That's why we take out volatile food and energy prices uh, from the CPI, because when gold backed money, it used to mean revert. The problem is that doesn't happen anymore. Sure. <laughs> so anyways, that, that's another topic. But, you know, crossing off the, the oh, sorry, one, one more story about this, because I, I, you know, and we can pick all sorts of items in the economy. But one of my favorites was. I was at a hedge fund retreat about a year ago from, from today. Uh, a lot of my former my Goldman colleagues. Yes, you, you don't use hedge fund and retreat in the same sentence these days. <laughs> yeah. It's just a bad connotation. Well, the funny thing is, and, and, uh, and we had a former treasury secretary there that, uh, uh, that is one of the advisors and, and, and talking, about, um, uh, you know, talking about various things. And even this crowd was complaining about a $165 lift ticket at Vail. And, and I said, you know, you want to make a bet that, that measured in gold, the lift ticket price is actually the same as the day it opened. Uh, so, so as I'm there, like on my, on Slack, on my, on my phone, I, I message my analyst, uh, and, uh, and he runs the numbers. Okay. So 1965, Vail, uh, Vail opens $5 lift ticket. Uh, measured in, 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 in dollars today, that's $165. So, so it, you know, the, the math, the math works. And, and again, as you stretch the arrow over time, it doesn't work within a cycle, it works through cycles. So the store of value, you know, function of money, that's checked off. And, and I think, again, that, that's back to the physics, which we can, can or can't go into later. Um, but the store of value function works. Medium of exchange, unit of account. Um, anyways, I'll, I'll let you get some questions in. But, no, but, no, but you, no are... listen, you keep going. I always figure that the yeah. less I talk, the more value the viewers yeah. get. So you keep talking. Sure. Uh, so the medium of exchange and, and unit of account functions. Um, medium of exchange, I, I think, is probably less important in today's, today's world, particularly with technology. Now, you know, there's, there's things like Bitcoin, which is probably the world's greatest medium of exchange that's, that's ever been created. Uh, just, just absolutely, you know, very, very interesting uh, exchange technology. Um, it's got different store of value functions. Uh, you know, let's put that aside for a second. But, but the, the point is in this economy, 
uh, with, with so much uh, communication and so many, like all of these innovations around medium exchange, like whether it's the paper check or the ATM machine, uh, the you know, Visa or MasterCard networks, PayPal, um, all these are not changes in money technology, but the changes in how we message and communicate a settlement or, or medium exchange. So I think the medium exchange is less important now as long as you can get liquidity and fungibility in any, any currency. You know, I can take my Canadian credit card, spend it here at a local merchant, no one cares that it's Canadian dollars. Yeah. Uh, no one cares if it's Bitcoin backing it or gold or, or you know, maybe a, you know ETF stock index and there's companies trying to do that. So, so the medium exchange, as long as there's a settlement mechanism to go from one asset to another, uh, I think is less important role of money in, in today's economy. The third one, unit of account, uh, but so, so again, gold can be used as a medium of exchange, objectively. Uh, we do it at our, at our do, company, yeah, gold absolutely. money. Uh, we, we allow people to use gold as a transactional medium. Um, and, and again, this is, this is choice. We're not saying it's going to be the only one. Uh, that, that, you know, there, there's always this, again, coming back to religion, there's always got to be this one, you know, this one right path. It's either got to be Federal Reserve, you know, central bank management. It's got to be Bitcoin or cryptocurrency or gold. Be like, one's just going to win. No, like, you know, we, we live in a world of choice and, and, and different preferences. And they all have different utilities. They all have different, different you know, ways of working. Um, and so, so we just created gold to be a transactional rail as well. And I think also interesting about that, that aspect is, I think still, if you go to, to 7 billion humans on planet Earth and try to settle a trade, and you have the choice of any of these mediums, I still think on an absolute population number, more people accept that gold to settle a trade than, than anything else. Yes. Um, obviously, that's weighted towards India and China and Southeast Asia, um, but it's, it's unit, you know, it's medium exchange function is not going away. Uh, and, and so, so that I think can be ruled out objectively. Um, the last one is the unit of account, which I think we already talked about as well in the store of value and how things revert to the mean and how that's, you know, and I believe that's actually of the three qualities of money, that's probably the one that gets least, um, the, the least time is, is the measurement quality. But I think gold's uh, uh, unit of account is probably its strongest quality and probably the one that the world needs more than anything right now. Um, because we have, we have this completely subjective manipulated measurement called you know, uh, fiat currencies, which they used to have rules, they used to have, you know, we're gonna try to manage them with the interest rate, we're gonna try to control you know, all the things that we can control so they maintain their store of value, just as good as gold, as I think uh, you know, Milton Friedman once said uh, with, with this new model. Yeah. Um, you know, meanwhile, it's lost you know, 98% of its value since that time. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, but the unit of account is so important because that's the price when the physical economy clears. Um, and and that's, the, that's the invisible hand of the economy that we wanna be hearing what it's saying. You know, if you go back to Adam Smith and, and, and moral sentiments and, and what the invisible hand was all about, it wasn't trying to justify the moral you know, view of, of, of you know, capitalism. What it, was trying to, what it was trying to say is there's moral sentiments in humans that they're gonna do this no matter what system you try to force them into. So, so yeah. the invisible hand is, 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 a, is a philosophy uh, that decentralization call it, you know, using some more, more uh, uh, modern terms. It's a philosophy that the decentralization works and it tells you something. But if you don't know how to measure it, you know, imagine trying to build a, build a, uh, build a house that the, the, the unit of you know, inches or feet or meters or whatever changed every, you know, every board meeting of, of the central committee on, on measurement. Uh, and, and, we, and, and maybe to stimulate more construction, we want to build buildings that are gonna fall down faster, we just can rebuild them. So, you know, so the central uh, management of, of measurement is gonna change the, the unit of a meter. Uh, you know, every, you know, every, uh, every month or every quarter. Uh, you know, that, that to me is, is a real problem because people think their wage contract is a dollar. Yeah. They think that dollar is something universal because it's in the denominator of the equation, price divided by, you know, the unit. So, so if you don't have a good unit of exchange, all sorts of things go off track, uh, which I think is actually the core problem in our entire economy and society right now. But Again, that's that's a, that's another religious. But it's discussion. interesting because this unit of account thing. I want to dig into this deeper because it's you know, there's 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 two ways you can read that, right? You can read it in a pure accounting way, and you can read it as in holding somebody to account. And that, to me, is the reason why central banks dislike gold because it holds them to account. To your to your point about what it does, yeah. you have this unit of account, 
And that's arguably the most dangerous thing. And, and you know, there are, there are a thousand conspiracy theories about gold. You know, some of them are interesting, some of them are ludicrous, some of them, you know, it's, it's harder to argue. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to argue that they're not correct, but you right. kind of have to do it anyway. But it's this, it's this uh, antagonistic relationship between central right. banks and gold that, that I find so fascinating because of exactly what you've laid out just there. It, it basically proves the damage that's been done to savers, to the middle class, to yeah, whoever, yeah. by fiat currency, a wholly fiat system. And so do you think when you, when you look through this through your engineer's eyes, you look through it through the eyes of your, your gold money position, do you see, what do you, what do you see the future looking like in terms of gold's role in a monetary system, which feels to me like it's on its last legs? Yeah, you know, I think whether whether we get some democratic consensus that, that that gold or Bitcoin or some other alternative money is going to be the replacement, I think the you know history is that inevitable inevitably these fiat currencies always fail. It's got a one hundred percent track yeah. record of failure. Uh, and again, this isn't theory or belief. I'm not trying to offend anybody. But that's just what's happened. Yeah. <laughs> and so and so I think that yes, naturally. As more people recognize this, this um, you know th th these physics, these these sort of fi first principles qualities of gold, it's always because of that role, it's always going to have some reversion to it, um, and and whether that's whether that's in a decentralized manner, will people simply vote with their feet, uh, which is obviously our business model. We're not trying to um, you know we're not trying to force people on a gold standard. We're not trying to force some sort of central co coercion. We're just saying you know. You know, gram for dollar, whose product is better? <laughs> you know, yeah. if the central banks want to have a want to have a better product, have at it. You know, build a better product. But right now, you don't. You don't have a better product for savers. Um, you know, for someone that wants to borrow and has the access to borrow, fiat's great. You know, like you actually get paid. So, so this is another you know, aspect of central banking that a lot of people for, don't realize, and and you know, you can easily see the inequality in our economy because of this. So, if you're rich, you get paid to use money. You get airline points, you get cash back. As long as you can access credit and, the, and, and the, the, the unit of that credit is decaying, you are getting paid by the rest of society to use money. Uh, to, and, and you get your free points, you get to use it. Meanwhile, if I'm paying cash, that merchant's paying 3% processing fees, which is going back to pay you money. So the cost of goods are higher. So, so the person that's at the, at, you know, it's a monetary waterfall, you know, the, the people closest to the center have less purchasing power decay from the system. They get paid to use money. And then people at the bottom who are just wage earner, particularly if it's cash, have higher cost of goods and they have to pay to use money. So, so, so the inequality is built into the system, whether they like it or not. Um, and, and so, so that, you know, that to me is, is a big problem. So, you know, getting back to the, the future of money, you know, we, we, there's a lot of thought and a lot of writing about the history of money, but really it's kind of the future of money that is important right now because we've been through these regimes before. You know, I don't think we've ever had a purely fiat world monetary system, but we have one now. But unfortunately, yeah. it's the one that everybody has spent their entire lives in, essentially. Right. Um, and so this idea of a change of any sort from that is such a huge leap for people to make, which is perfectly understandable. So when you have these conversations with people, you know, have you, have you, what's the closest you've ever, argument you've ever heard that's made you think, ah, oh, you know what, he's got a point? Or, or have you not even got anywhere close to that yet? You know, I, I don't think I've, I've um, gotten close to that point. I, again, I, I think the future is choice. The future in just about every, every system seems to be more complexity and more choice. Um, and, and, you know, whether it's social values, whether it's, you know, goods on the, on the shelf at a grocery market, whether it's investment products, you know, choice and proliferation seems to be, and, and more complexity and chaos seems to be the order, order of, of everything. So, so you know, I, I actually think that, that, yeah, I mean, I think people that want to legally and, and rationally and in some safe, you know, uh, you know, system use gold or Bitcoin or, or dollars or, you know, maybe you like the Canadian dollar and you want to run around New York using the Canadian dollar. Like, I, I think that that's, um, you know, I, I think that's the future you know, until some of these key ones, you know, finally give in. And, and that, that world looks very different. I don't want to necessarily speculate it and take it down the, the gold bug route. No, sure. um, but but I, I, I do think that, that choice is going to be a key part of this going forward. But, we, you know, we have, we have 
we find ourselves in the middle of what people call the central bank bubble, the confidence bubble, the everything bubble, the mother of all bubble. We've heard them all. Yeah. People seem to recognize that we're in some sort of bubble here. Right. And generally speaking, when those bubbles burst, it, it takes away choice and it takes away complexity. It takes away chaos. It creates it, but the response right. is, okay, we need to suck all that out of the system because yeah. of this chaos. We can't let it loose. You know, which, which says to me when this bubble bursts, the control that's going to try and be exerted, the forces that are going to be brought to bear to try and control that chaos, that complexity you talk about, will have to be of a magnitude far, far greater than we've seen at any point. I think so, but but what is, and again, I don't want to take this down an overtly negative or political path, because no, 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 like, no, I'm totally sorry. speculating here, but but I I think in some ways this 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 information uh, economy, call it, you know, is 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 hopefully improve the situation where where I think if if something would have gone down that route in 2007, it probably could have been controlled through nationalism or yeah. some police state or military. You know, I'm, and I'm talking about the West here. Um, and by the way, I don't think that would have happened. Um, but I, you know, I think actually the, the economy would have healed itself much better. Um, but you know, let's let's say that all hell did break root loose. You know, post Lehman and you know, letting them all fail. You know, AIG and the rest. Um, I think society would have been at a place where they maybe would have accepted some sort of new system of control. I think the difference this time is they're rapidly losing that power. You know, they're they're rapidly losing trust in all institutions, whether it's you know political or or rule of law, legal, or you know just this this perception of everything being corrupt, this cynicism. I just don't know if if someone is gonna you know obey those those you know that this new dictate that yeah. no you know what you're not allowed to have this element owned in the piece of earth you know it's not backing our monetary system anymore but I'm just not gonna let you allow allow you to own gold anymore and you can't allow tr own trees anymore either like I, I just don't think society will accept that now you know you know Uber. Uh, you know, for all of the things they do wrong with breaking the rule of law, you know, they blast an email to their community in a small town, they can vote out the mayor, right? right? So, right. so like, I think people that when something provides utility to them, uh, I think today, you know, I, I hope, you know, again, this is, this is probably more the hope hat than, than maybe necessarily the rational path, but um, I, I, I do think that, that, that people will embrace choice. Uh, and, and hopefully views like ours um, or some from the Bitcoin community or elsewhere will, uh, will, will have, a, you know, have a see that debate without being ridiculed and belittled by some of the mainstream economists as they yeah. like to do um, and, and just you know, actually have a debate about, about, about these things. Well, let, let's talk about, about your business because you, you guys are in a unique position to really understand how sentiment's changing, how acceptance is changing. You know, what, what are the trends that you're seeing in people's adoption of, now, now you've given them this ability to use right. golden transactional way, how are you seeing that be adopted? Yeah, I mean, I, I think people that people that recognize it and, and have, kind of have an open mind to it, and you know, it's, it's growing every month, you know, our, our payments, our, um, our, our transactions, you know, you know we have, we've got clients, you know, I, I think I've told you the story of Fuhor, you know, the client in Singapore that his son goes to school in Canada, he buys with Sing Dollar, he buys gold in the morning, sends the title to his son who sells and redeems, you know, to his, you know, Canadian bank account. Same day, you know, we had the, the time zone advantage there, but same day, he can go from one bank to another. And, and these are the kind of promises of the Bitcoin, you know, uh, economy as well, is that you have this sort of cross-sovereign asset that can be you know, held and owned in both sides. And so it makes clearing happening a lot faster. So, so that one is gold just being a bridge. Um, and, and that one works well. I use it, people do it. Um, it's so much easier for me to buy gold and, you know, and, and then sell it for you know, my, you know, moving from my Canadian bank account to my US bank account. It's just easier than using the federal bank you know, wire system. Yeah. Um, and and you know, again, you know, Bitcoin can do all these things. So I think there's that aspect of it. And then there's also the peer-to-peer -peer side. Um, that one's slower to be adopted, uh, you, know, you know, truth be told. And, and, and I think that's the same with, with the Bitcoin economy, what they're seeing as well, is people want to buy and hold it. Yeah, <laughs> um, right. Or maybe borrow, you know, at least in our case, you, know, you can borrow against it and spend you know, US dollars or something like that, like a line of credit. So, so there, are, there are other ways people use it. But, but again, we're not really forcing anyone to do anything. We're just building the tools so that they can be used. <laughs> and, and so we are seeing that people that find them and use them, uh, it's, it is taking, you know, it is, people are taking off. But do you see, I mean, what trends are you seeing geographically? Because the, you, you've got, as you said, your earlier point, you've got 
a big chunk of the global population who are positively inclined towards this asset. They save in it for millennia, they use it transactionally, they gift it, they do all, it's, it's just, it is a currency to them. And then you've got this side of the world where people just aren't using it. Are you seeing that adoption? I presume it's pretty solid out in Asia and China and India, but are you seeing anything, any changes in sentiment in the West? It's, it's, that's a slow ship to, to turn. Yeah, not sure. <laughs> um, and and I, I, I will say that we have, you know, I'd say the, the, the most of the, most of the people that are on our platform, um, typically new gold or new cryptocurrency, I think we created an accessibility layer that, that, you know, we did have lots of feedback when we sent out a sort of a blast email to our early adopters. And there were a good percentage that had never used uh, or never owned gold before because we made it, you know, very easy and safe and, you know, great UX, UI, all the technology side to actually, you know, sign up an account, buy $100 with a gold or set a reoccurring payment to, to just deposit $100 a week or month or whatever. We, we built all these tools, so we made it very accessible. I mean, if you were only saving $100 a month in the past, it would have taken you a year to buy an ounce of gold. So, so you know, having those tools, I think, has made it more accessible, but the knowledge barrier is still very high. So, like, it is, it is still, um, you know, for as fast as we're growing by just, you know, getting people onto the platform, um, it's, you know, getting, getting some of my friends and, you know, Facebook colleagues or whatever, I think, you know, to just to sign up and use it, just, you know, trust me, this, this works, the math works, it's, you know, it's, it's a slower sell. But you know, you've been talking about this stuff for a long time, as has Roy, and you, you, know, you talk very eloquently about it. And this is what brings us back to where we started with this thing. You know, you, there are a lot of very, very smart people in the gold space who are gifted communicators telling you know, a, a, a positive story that's held true over millennia. And we come back to this religion thing. We come back to this wall that goes up yeah. where people just say, no, don't, don't even bother talking about it. I mean, how, how do you try, when you talk to people about this, we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about it at the beginning, but how do you try and break that wall down? It's <laughs> yeah, things like this. I mean, yeah. just, just really, and, and, and also I think the very important thing is we're not telling you ever that gold is going to 5,000. We're not, we're not promising you riches. <laughs> We're, we're, you know, although we try our hardest, we're not telling you that, you know, the government and society is going to collapse. Even though most people generally, I think, are starting to believe that, right, right. <laughs> like, you know, even in the mainstream, um, that's not our sales pitch. Um, and, you know, that's the one that still works, by the way, you know, in, in a lot of these alternative assets. But we're trying not to do that. We're trying to just say, look, you're always even. <laughs> and always even in this world is a pretty good yeah, place to be. It's a good starting <laughs> so, point. So, you know, that, that's what we're always trying to, trying to tell. And it's not a, you know, it's not an easy way to get people to, to sign up right away, but I think it's the truth. And so if we want to be building this business for 10 years, 20 years, you know, 50 years, that's what we need to do. Uh, we, we, we can't take any shortcuts um, and try to promise something that we can't, you know, we, we can't deliver. Now, you, now, your business started, you know, when I first met you and Roy in, in Toronto, more years ago now than I care to remember, you were Bitgold. You, know, this right. was, you started in the Bitcoin and gold world. Yeah. And this is another big debate that people go on. We've, we've now not only got the people that prefer money over gold, it's Bitcoin over gold. You know, to me, gold and Bitcoin can coexist perfectly, yeah. uh, happily. But talk a little bit about the, the sort of nexus of those two worlds, because you guys are right there. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, what, we, that's what Roy and I recognized. So, so we actually started on this system um, I think before we were we were uh, really interested in Bitcoin. I, I mean, I, I, you know, Roy particularly was was buying Bitcoin very early. Um, you know, just just you know, just diving into everything alternative and just you know, just just again the, the, the contrarian and 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 so he was very early. And I remember him telling me about it, and and I was like, yeah, that's really cool mathematically. That that sounds like it makes sense. And of course, I didn't act on it. You know, he did. Right. Um, and. Uh, and, but at some point, you know, we were also talking about, you know, just having this gold custodian business. It had nothing to do with Bitcoin. So, so just why isn't there one financial, in, uh, financial institution backed fully by gold? You know, you've got, you know, Canadian dollar backed ones, US dollar backed ones. Why isn't there one that just says, the math of gold works, let's make a gold backed institution? Uh, that to us seemed really odd that there, that there wasn't one doing it. So then we asked, how could we do it? And, and, and how do we build it? Is this, is this some marble column, you know, you know, bank and, and, and you know, secrecy and all of that. But what we saw with Bitcoin, and this is what really inspired the idea for Bitgold, like, you know, we were always about gold, but it was the, 
it was the use cases of Bitcoin. It was it was the it was the nature of decentralization and and distributed technology and trying to have more pieces and not just having like marble columns, you know, hugging all the customers. You know, don't go there. Just stay in our realm. Um, I think that idea, Bitcoin, really inspired us. Um, and then not only that, the use cases. We looked at it and we said, okay, all of these things. You know, the the, the uh, example I gave before about gold being the bridge between two currencies, whether you whether you need it or not, it's a more logical system than you know, OTC correspondent banking net webs. You know, with with some manipulated fix in London. Uh, you know, and, and and a wire that goes missing for four days. Like you know, using a bridge sovereign asset is 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 a better way to transact internationally. So we said, oh well, that's. All that cool stuff that's happening in Bitcoin and the technology space, you know, that's around a, you know, at the time, whatever, a billion dollar asset class. In gold, you get a seven, you know, seven trillion dollar asset class with no innovation, no technology. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't we not necessarily copy the technology of Bitcoin, but why don't we talk the use case and the business model? And so, uh, and so, so that's really where it got started. But we also had this other key sort of. You know the, the the Canadian expression. You know you want to skate to where the where the puck is headed. Right. The other view that we had is whether the world goes into this crypto, uh, you know, decentralized currencies. I'm really not smart enough to know. Uh, I, I like a lot of things about it. There's things I don't like about it, um, but I'm not smart enough to know where we're going. But what I do know, again, back to the physics, gold will be a store of value no matter what in the, in whatever world, whatever economy, and it's going to be demanded no matter what. So I want to be part of the interoperability between Bitcoin and gold. So that was another thing that we focused on very early, and, and that was the name. That was another reason why the name Bitgold. Um, I think it turns out that that Bitgold, you know, the Bitgold name just it really didn't it didn't achieve what we wanted to do. People thought, oh, is this a Bitcoin backed by gold, which we, we think is actually illogical, um, or you know, and obviously Nick Zabo's you know white paper uh, on Bitgold. You know, there was there was a lot of pushback for using the name Bitgold. So, you know, there's many reasons why it just didn't make sense. So when we acquired gold money, we just took the name gold money. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we were inspired. And I think the world is learning a lot about money and the properties of money and the fundamental properties of sovereignty um, around, because of Bitcoin. So I think that's a good thing no matter what happens. Okay, so we began with religion. We kind of got back to religion. You, 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 you showed us that the whole thing works. So... Just lay out and explain why it works. Yeah. Why does this system work? That, that's the hard part, and, and I, I think that's where we're really getting into to some new theory that, that Roy and I have been building, sort of independently and then together for you know the last you know I guess together for about the last decade. But um, going back to this this physics, and and for me it was is recognize the energy component. Um, so. Uh, Probably the best way to explain it is, is maybe just walk through the path of how I question currency and everything else. So, when I back to my my political risk days and 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 quantitative political risk, I, I like to take the first principles of valuation of any asset. So so you know let's talk about a mine in Zambia. So a mine in Zambia, uh, your first principle starts with the geology. Uh, what is the the geologic inventory? And obviously, what's the uncertainty from all the drill holes? What are the mathematical models to quantify that in, in uncertainty? That that's the first principle of what your inventory is. Uh, then you have to look at your you know at your fixed costs and your wages and your labor. But the other major component in any extractive industry is energy. What is the energy to put into the ore, to blast, to haul, to to mine, refine? You know all of that. So so any any material coming from the earth has an energy input. So, so I'm not even talking about capital yet. I'm just talking about first yeah. principles, <laughs> you know, things things that you can't change. It's quantitative. It's physics. So, so then you you get that, and then you you know you go line by line through your costs and all of this, and you can generally map it all out as an energy. There's one thing in the in the entire model that, that I I actually have no understanding of the fundamentals, and that's what is the value of the Zambian kwacha. You know, so, so that's the part where I started really questioning currency. I, you know, that's the one thing I can't use first principles right. to figure out. And even my political risk analysis and how I want to create a discount rate or an effective tax rate or however I want to quantify the political risk, you can actually map out human systems and the risks of you know, too many tax payments going to one, you know, one agency and you need to separate it. So there's all of these ways to mitigate your geologic risk, your energy risk, your political risk. But what, how do you mitigate the currency risk? Uh, you know, other than you know, a big hedge or a swap. You know, that's the one fundamental. So, so then I had to, you know, then I'm like, okay, now, now I got to figure out this currency thing, right? <laughs> and so I think that's where it all started. But to me, 
it, it goes back to those first principles of the economy of that everything that, and, and Roy came to the same conclusion, you know, everything that we touch, feel, consume, all of the tools for our information economy, all of it still comes from the ground. All of it has some cost of energy, the energy input in versus what's the yield and what's the product coming out. So I like to map the entire economy based on these you know, thermodynamic concepts of everything has a energy cost of production um, and then everything has an entropy or, or you know, call it a rate of decay from a financial standpoint. And if you look at the backwardation, or, or sorry, the, the contango in a commodity uh, you know, price curve, it's the same thing. So, so you have, you're anchored by a marginal cost of production or, or, a, or an expe expect you know, expected marginal uh, cost of production, and then you discount today's price by the cost of storage and decay. So, so if, you, if you go through the economy, uh, again, just, we'll start at the, at the you know, before we get into tertiary industries, let's, let's start at the, um, uh, the, the, the commodity economy. You have rates of decay in things that, that decay fast. You have electricity, natural gas, oil, grains, coal, uh, and then you have base metals, precious metals. And funny enough, those rates of decay also is their financial volatility. So, so you look down that whole spectrum and you have the highest volatility is in natural gas, the lowest volatility is in gold. So then I start thinking, okay, there's something, there's some physics, there's some thermodynamics to this whole economic system. Uh, and then we started trying to layer in, okay, so in, a, you know, in, in this segment or this, this industry, you know, how much is intellectual property? How much is, is IP? And what is the fundamental, what's the first principle cost of labor? Uh, and the first principle cost of labor is still feeding yourself, shelter. There's still a very high energy component. So, so you'll talk to economists and they'll say, we've moved way beyond the, the natural resource economy. Well, no, not really, because most people and, 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 uh, and economies work in, in power laws. They don't work in normal distribution. So this is a Pareto concept. Um, but most of the people are still closer to the commodity. Their, their, their main cost of, of living is, is very commodity driven, uh, you know, whether it's you know, going out to eat or putting a roof over their head, you know, the, the cost of utilities and bills, it's still a high percentage, which is why they work. So, so labor still has a very high energy component in it as well. So you've got energy and labor, you've got energy obviously in the natural uh, commodities. Um, so, so what is the decay of the services they create? What's the dissemination of information of their IP? So, so all of this, I still get back to these same models of, of rates of decay versus, you know, versus their, their replacement cost and energy. So I, I just model the entire economy that way. And gold is very interesting in that of all of the things you can create in the economy, it's got the highest percentage of energy cost because of its scarcity. Because it's so small and so, so uh, value dense, because you have to mine so much rock, you have to crush you know, a ton of rock to get a gram of gold, uh, and, and then all of the refining and everything else. So, so it's got a, about a 70% energy replacement cost. So it's very tied to what's the value of, of, of oil in the economy, uh, and always will be because of that. But unlike any other commodity, it lasts forever. Mm -hmm. So it has zero rate of decay, but it has a 70% energy cost of production. So that, that anchor, that value anchor, will be constant. Like particularly as you stretch time and everything else decays, then all that's left is the energy component, and then it, it's gonna be constant 30 years later. So, so that's the model, that's the theory that, that, that we came up with, with why this works. Um, and we're trying to mathematically, systematically prove that um, and falsify other theories. Um, you know, we're trying to do that while running a business. So it's, yeah. you know, it becomes... You be careful going down uh, that rabbit hole, It, it my becomes, uh, there's, a lot, there's, there's a lot going on here. Um, but, but that's why we, we found that gold always works. And we think this is a first principle. We don't think this is subjective. We think this is a very objective view of money. Um, you know, Roy has actually written some very good papers on medium, um, the natural properties of money, uh, and uh, a number of others, um, at, you know, as I have. And, uh, and then we have our research uh, that we're starting to put on your platform. Yeah. Uh, it's on Bloomberg at, at um, GMIR Go, uh, Gold Money Investment Research. Um, so we, we try to make all this accessible, but you know, we are trying to wrap this into a, you know, a bigger theory. Well, as, as I say, you and I met in Hong Kong and had a similar conversation to this one. And, you know, the first time I sat down with you and Roy, and I made a point of coming to see you when I was in Toronto one time, was because I'd read the stuff you'd written. I thought, you know, these guys, they look at this a different way. So, you know, I'm just really happy that a lot more people are going to get a chance to sit down and listen to the way you guys think about it. Because, you know, it's, it's an archaic commodity. Yeah. 
but that doesn't mean there aren't new ways to think about it. And I think what you guys are doing in terms of getting these new ways to think about it across is is an incredible service to people. Hopefully, you know, I don't, I, whether we change anyone's mind or not, I, you know, we just want to... No, I appreciate I, it. I, 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 we just want to make people think, right? And say, okay. Absolutely. No, and, that, and that's the best part. Like, I, you know, Roy and I both love the dialectic. You know, like we're, we're out there like, picking fights on Twitter. And, <laughs> and, and you know what? That's how I learn the most. And yeah. when, I, when I am proven wrong... Like it humbles you, right? And so, so you refine your like. But we, we've got this this society that doesn't seem to want to do that. Like yeah. you know, if something's so, so you can you can debate theories and uncertainty and unprovable things, and that's that's again that's the religious view. But you can't debate objective facts. If I say gold's a store of value, and you say no, it isn't. You're just wrong, right? <laughs> you know, and that and that sort of particularly when it's in the context of financial advice. And, and I see this on the media all the time. You know, gold is this, gold is that. No, that's wrong. Uh, you know, gold uh, is pur- purported to be a store of value, but it doesn't hold up very well. That's wrong. Like, like that, that's bad financial advice, and that, that view needs to be punched in the face. Like, like that's, that's, the, that, that's how we need to, like, frame this. this. And, and again, if I'm wrong, no, right back at me. Um, and, and so that's, I, I think that's what the approach we're taking, because society needs to solve these problems. But while, you know, while we're on this subject, let's qu- quickly throw this in there. You know, the, the Jeremy Siegel's book, The Stocks of the Long Run, right? He's yeah. the guy who, sa- who said, you know, over all this time, you'd own stocks, you were way ahead, you own bonds, you were a little bit ahead. If you'd own gold, you were down. Right. You know, how, how do you debunk that? I mean, that, that Is also, it just a question of time? That's frame, actually or? very easy, and, and I, I'm not sure if Roy's published it yet. I know he wrote this actually a long time ago, I think even before Bitgold. Um, but there's a lot of mathematical tricks, just like the CPI index in that. So if you actually own, so Warren Buffett uses this too, if I would have bought you know, right. the, the exactly. Dow at the turn of the century. Actually, of those 100 companies, I think three exist. Well, that's, yeah, that's the problem so, with the Dow. So no, you bought an index. Yeah. An index has to be managed. It has to be bought and sold. You've got to throw out your losers. You, you've got to, like, and that takes fees. That takes friction. There's, there's losses there. That there's, there's, there's a decay. <laughs> that, that's, not, that's not a constant that just goes up. Uh, if you just own these companies, most of them die. Uh, and so, so, and that's, that's probably the biggest trick of the financial industry. And, and you know, I've been asked the question too, you know, I can understand maybe if central banks got this all wrong, but why do finance guys get it wrong? And the incentive is to promise that unachievable, uh, you know, spread se- spreadsheet index that you actually can't own. Yeah. It has to be managed. Yeah. And, and what happens when it manages it? You get paid. So the incentive is to get paid to manage that index. And, and I'm not saying that's good or bad. Like that, that's, you know, I, I still think that's a good thing. That's capital allocation. All of this, you know, all of this is, is a good thing in the economy. Um, but, you know, gold is boring because you actually don't really have to manage it. it. It really, you know, and maybe I'm giving away a business secret here, but it's not that hard to store gold, you know. No, it's sure. a very good rule of law. I mean, you've got to understand the good providers and who's got good systems for risk mitigation and insurance and all of these things. But, you know, gold, you know, does not cost 40 basis points to hold like it costs in the gold ETF. Like that, that's a total, sure. you know, friction and a loss of money. You know, with us, it's well under a, under a kilogram. It's actually free, <laughs> so so that's the fr- that's the best storage, particularly for someone that that, that can't afford a lot of financial friction. Yeah. Um, but even above that, you know, you know, we're we're talking about sub twenty basis points. So this isn't an expensive hold, um, and and so that you know that to me is a, is a natural decay. Now a barrel of oil, that's a much more expensive hold. A a warehouse full of you know aluminum, that's that's a more expensive hold. So all of these things are fundamental. Well, look, I, I, I enjoy your Twitter dialogues, you and Roy. And, and look, if you're going to pick one fight on Twitter about gold, do me a favor. Just tweet, at real Donald Trump, gold, <laughs> yeah. gold is a store of value. Let's just see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Maybe he'll come back and pick a fight with you. You know, actually, this, new, this administration, I think, is probably biased that, that, that way. That to, to, and I, I wouldn't say they necessarily have this deep understanding of it, but they do understand that it was worked historically. Yeah, yeah. I think um, so, and so. That's, that's the other part that I just I don't understand is, is when people just want to just kind of forget actual history and, and math and, and just call you a gold bug. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that, but I think it's hard to forget history you never learned in the first place. And I think that's right. the big problem. Yeah. Josh, look, we've run out of time. Yeah. This is, I, I love talking to you and Roy. Right. It's just so much fun. You guys just have a unique way of thinking about this. So it's a thanks for taking the time in New York to come and talk to me. Great. Thank you.